Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is August 24th, 2024. Let me repeat that. It's August 24th, 2024. Let's talk about some plays in the world right now. We'll throw out three plays. Uh, just understand, I believe the public is on the other side of each play. Right? But first, remember... The opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let's get back to the gambling life. If you're someone like me who believes that sometimes the betting line is wrong, sometimes there are opportunities, sometimes what's being discussed is off. So if you already believe, as I do, that Terrence Crawford is already retired. Right? Let's face it. He only wants to fight Canelo. I don't blame him. I think it's the right decision. Uh, just understand that if anything happens to Canelo, if Berlanga, big knockout puncher, lands a big shot, if Canelo loses within his next one or two fights, that Crawford-Canelo fight's never going to happen. I believe Crawford understands the power of the word unbeaten in terms of his legacy. Let's also uh, say that if you live in a world where the reigning two-time champion Kansas City Chiefs are not going to three-peat, right? if you realize that they're giving out big money now, uh, as a sign of appreciation to people who are clearly on the back nine career-wise. Um, you know, Travis Kelsey, for example. Then you understand that the Chiefs themselves realize that they are not going to three-peat. At least the odds are long, right? Understand how different the world would have been if on fourth down, in the overtime of the Super Bowl, the Chiefs weren't able to convert. The Niners would then be overwhelming favorites to repeat. That's how slim the margin is between being a big favorite and being an underdog. If you live in a world where Caleb, Bo, and Jaden, who've looked great in the preseason, uh, might be in a situation where none of them end the season with a 500 or better record, then this video might be for you. Let's talk about the three plays I see, and there'll be resistance to them. Some of the plays are hedge positions, where you want the play, and then you're going to try to hedge, so you get both sides of it, right? You get a bet in case the opponent wins. Right? The first bet. Folks, these two have already fought. Right? An argument can be made that the loser of the first fight is the best heavyweight of this generation. Very slim margin. Right? That third judge had one guy winning by one point. Right? Tyson Fury right now is going off at a plus 145. What are we doing? Folks, I wouldn't make Martin Bacoli, who hasn't held a heavyweight title, a plus 145 against Alexander Usyk. What are we doing making Tyson Fury, who's already seen Usyk for 12 rounds, who's already gone the distance with Usyk, who gets off the canvas and then is able to go several more rounds. Who's winning this fight until the later rounds? What are we doing making him a plus 145? Folks, you don't have to ask me who I think is the betting side of the play in this fight. You already know it. This fight is a jump ball. The guy who's getting the plus 145, that's the side I'm on. That's the base bet. Tyson Fury at a plus 145, sign me up. You know, 
let me also say too you saw Fury go down he's badly hurt I'm not here to cover that up right and there is a question on whether Fury's decaying right you saw an MMA guy in Ganu drop him right so there are questions but I need for folks to just think to themselves do you feel that Usyk is going to come across the ring and drop Tyson Fury in the first six rounds of the rematch? If the answer to that is no, you have an easy hedge and the plus 145 will help fund it. Let's talk about another bet. Right? This one's political. Look, my only agenda is to lock in great odds. That's my only agenda. Right? That bet is on whether Donald Trump wins the popular vote. Now, I did not say the election. I said the popular vote. Understand, Republicans have not won the popular vote in the United States in a presidential election for a few election cycles. Right? Um, understand, too, Trump did not win the popular vote when he won the presidency in 2016. What we're saying here is that not only will Trump win the election, he's going to win it going away by a margin he did not have in 2016. Right? I'll put it to you this way. The idea of a 25% tax on unrealized gains Right? Just think about the reporting requirements. Think about the people holding unrealized gains. Many of them are Democrats, right? Homeowners, for example. Um, to me, that's like betting on a fighter with a broken rib. In other words, you just heard me mention Tyson Fury. Even I would be on the Usyk side of the play uh, if right before the fight takes place, I found out that Tyson Fury had a broken rib. Right, folks? This Democrat idea of a 25% tax on unrealized gains deprives the Democrats of looking credible in this election. And understand, I'm not picking some side issue. This is actually a centerpiece issue for this election. Right? And understand, too, uh, if you're going to try to do something that's arguably unconstitutional and that's as radical as this, right? And again, keep in mind, we're not talking about a 1% or 2% or 5% or even 10%, some sales tax level tax here. They're talking about a confiscatory 25% tax on unrealized gains, right? In other words, you would have to tell them the equity you have in your home on paper that you haven't realized for them to then tax you that amount and how you're going to come up with the money is anyone's guess. Right? Understand, this is a tough sell if the candidate wasn't allergic to press conferences. Right? Imagine if a candidate was serious about this, went out and did press conferences and then tried to make the case to the American people. I remember earlier generation Ronald Reagan trying to explain supply-side economics to the public. In other words, he had to make the sale. Now, if your candidate isn't someone who is inclined to give a lot of press conferences because this one's going to take quite a bit to educate the public. There are a lot of questions that need to be answered. Right? I believe just the idea that the candidate thinks that this is possible is going to give Donald Trump an opening to win the popular vote. Let me also make another point too. At a time when Fidelity, Van Eck, BlackRock, 
all have spot Bitcoin ETFs at a time where we now have spot Ethereum ETFs at a time where a Bobby Kennedy was talking about the United States having a Bitcoin reserve right at a time where Donald Trump is talking about setting things up so nobody beats the United States in terms of Bitcoin creation the Democratic platform did not mention cryptocurrency. How could it if you're going to try to put a 25% tax on unrealized gains? Now, I know we just had a real joyous event. Everyone was smiling. Um, you know, people gave great speeches at a Democratic convention. Recognize the dysfunction that's under the surface. How long did it take Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, Nancy Pelosi to embrace Kamala Harris? Right, according to rumor, Barack Obama wanted Kelly of Arizona at the top of the ticket. Right, let's remember, Joe Biden announces that he's not staying in the race. Time then passes before Joe then announces that he's supporting Kamala Harris. Right? So they can smile for the camera. They can have Oprah, you know, show up at the convention. Right? Let me say, too, I'm not anti-Democrat. <laughs> Understand, I'm from a family where my dad was a social worker and my parents, immigrants, I'm an immigrant, we're heavily into the Democratic Party. I'm not anti-Democrat. In an earlier election, I voted for Kamala Harris when she ran for something, right? Might have been Attorney General of the state of California, might have been her Senate race, right? Uh, I voted for Kamala Harris in the past, but you need to recognize the dysfunction, recognize the unlikelihood of some of these positions being embraced recognized to the reluctance to submit the candidate to press conferences let's talk about our third bet that's going to sound controversial right this video will be online i have no plans of taking it down we'll find out together how it ages but in boxing a promoter who was trying to fight, excuse me, who was trying to sign a fighter. And it's a Hall of Fame promoter, Oscar De La Hoya. He's a guy who fought Pernell Whitaker. He's a guy who fought Floyd Mayweather. Oscar issued a statement saying that Shakur Stevenson might be the most talented fighter he had ever seen. <laughs> now I laugh. I should laugh. Right, let's be clear where I'm coming from. Shakur is not Pernell Whitaker. Right, Shakur is not Floyd Mayweather. Right, in a fight between Shakur Stevenson and Mayweather, the best punch either guy would have would be Mayweather's left hook. Right, look at the Diego Corrales fight. Right, understand in terms of defense, Shakur is great defensively. Mayweather is blessed defensively. Mayweather's a all-time level of defense. I don't think Ray Robinson had Mayweather's level of defense. Right? So, Shakur Stevenson ends up with Eddie Hearn, Matchroom, another big promotional group. Right? Shakur, of course, is supposed to uh, fight Joe Cordina. Right after that, we're hearing that Shakur is going to fight William Zepeda and then Tank Davis. Right? I, If that happens, I don't believe Stevenson, who I'm convinced knocks out Cordina. Right? After all, Cordina in his last fight got stopped by a southpaw at 130 and Stevenson would be fighting Cordina at 135. Right, but I don't think Stevenson beats William Zepeda. Let's go one step further. 
I have very strong doubts on whether Stevenson beats Tank Davis. If, in fact, Stevenson's next three fights are Cordina, Zepeda, and Tank Davis, I don't believe Stevenson comes out of those three fights unbeaten. Right? So, pay close attention to the Stevenson situation. Take a look at age two. Understand that Stevenson is well into his 20s. Right now, you're a fighter relying on quickness on coordination, on defense, on spacing, right? I need for folks to understand that if you go back in history, Ali in the 60s, right? Arguably, in my mind at least, the best heavyweight to ever put on the gloves, right? Ali's 22 years old. Let's just do the math. He is 22 years old when he beat Sonny Liston. Right, Much of the Ali run in the 1960s has Ali fighting, and I'm mentioning Ali because, like Stevenson, cat quick reflexes. Right, Great athlete. Great athlete. Bigger punch than Shakur Stevenson, pound for pound. Right, Let's remember, Ali back then is predicting rounds when he's going to get a stoppage. An Ali fight that goes the distance. Ernie Terrell calls him Clay. Right? So Ali punishes Terrell and starts yelling at him, What's my name? If you're on the Ali side of the ledger, you believe Ali carried Ernie Terrell. That's how many knockouts Ali was getting in the 60s. Right? He stops people like Big Cat Williams. Right? Shakur is not that level in my eyes. I don't mean to pick on Shakur. I think he's a big time talent. Right? But once we start getting into boxing history, what I need for people to understand is if you're relying on hand speed and responsiveness and coordination, just understand that some of the guys who did it before you had some of their best moments. Right? Their first run as heavyweight champ before they were as old as you are now. <laughs> right? Understand, too. You know, Liston doesn't make it the distance in either fight against Ali. The second fight, Phantom Punch fight, Liston hits the canvas. Right? Now, Stevenson doesn't have that level of sudden power. In the comment section, sure, I'm going to get comments here saying, did Ali hit Liston? in that second fight. Okay, fair enough, right? You can't have that argument for fights like the Zora Folly fight, the Cleveland Williams fight, can you? Right? Doesn't Ali stop Archie Moore? Right? I know more light heavyweight, but understand, more drops Rocky Marciano, doesn't he? Right? Ali is going on a stretch in the 60s where he's stopping guys. Right? Stevenson hasn't stopped anyone recently. Understand. Stevenson is at an age. He's still a young man. But he's at an age where, let's just say, Mike Tyson had already done most of his great fighting. Right? Ali had already been heavyweight champ. I know Stevenson has had belts. But Ali had already had some of the biggest fights of his career. Right? Stevenson right now is that excellent fighter who, dare I say it here in public, might be a tad bit overrated. Right? Cepeda comes in at angles, has higher volume than Stevenson, hits harder than Stevenson, is going to come looking for Stevenson, Stevenson did not get a stoppage in his last fight against the guy who was in the pocket. Right? How's he going to handle Zepeda? Now, if you're following the Zepeda story, Zepeda recently became a father. Right? Understand, that's why he's not fighting, or he's about to be a father. That's why he's not fighting Shakur Stevenson now. There's no hesitation 
on the Zepeda side of the ledger on fighting Shakur Stevenson. Right? There isn't that fear that Zepeda is going to run into some big shots. Right? I think Zepeda understands the risk isn't the same. As would be the case if Zepeda tries to crash the pocket against the Tank Davis, against the puncher. Right? Understand, too, if Stevenson is fortunate enough to get by Zepeda, he'd have a problem with Tank Davis. Let me just say this, and I've mentioned it before, and I know it's controversial, and I know many people disagree with me. If I were Stevenson, I would venture to 140. First of all, the division's loaded. Right? But understand, at 140, you have different type people. Right, Zepeda is going to come looking for Stevenson. A Jack Catterall might not. A Regis Progre, who's fighting Catterall, uh, lost badly to back foot heavy Devin Haney. In fact, he even got knocked down in the fight. Understand, if Progre were to beat Catterall, uh, if I'm Stevenson, I would think, you know, Progre has a problem with guys on their back foot. I could beat Regis Progre. Another guy who has problems with southpaws on their back foot is Teofimo Lopez. Right then, of course, you have Paro, who just beat Subiel Matias. I believe Subiel Matias, Puerto Rican, is left hook heavy. I believe someone as good as Stevenson can look at film and can say, okay, I'll stay away from that left hook. I believe Stevenson would be able to beat Subiel Matias, right? The Paro fight would be interesting. Paro, let's just say, isn't as proven as some of the other fighters, right? And there's that international flavor. Stevenson is not a box office king. Let's just cut through the BS here, right? If he's fighting outside of Newark, he does not pull crowds. But people respect him. A Paro Stevenson fight in Australia would be a sellout. Now, that's how I see it. Somebody who had that kind of career is Dimitri Bevel. Understand, Bevel has said many times that if needed, he could fight at 168. But this is a guy who understood who understands that he's not a knockout puncher. I believe he could be. But he prefers to move, throw combinations, be fast rather than load up on power. But he's smart enough to place himself at 175 because that works against the Jean Pascals of the world, against the light heavyweights who want to come find you, who are going to view you as light hitting, who are going to try to seek you out. Right, that actually plays into Bevo's hand. So, of course, Bevo has a victory over Canelo, for example. Right, Bevo, great career, Hall of Famer, unbeaten, has a fight against another surefire Hall of Famer, also unbeaten, with a 100% KO ratio, Arthur Perturbiev. You, the public right now, has made Bevo the betting favorite in that fight against an unbeaten champion with a 100% KO ratio because we understand Bevo can handle himself against heavy hitting guys. That actually plays into Bevo's setup. Right? You come looking for him. You think you're going to knock him out. He's countering you to death. He's throwing a lot of punches. If you look at Defense in terms of percentage of punches landed by an opponent, Beevil's around the top in boxing. Now, I don't understand why Stevenson doesn't jump to 140. I think he'd be very successful. Instead, he's hanging around 135 at a time when one of his nemesis, is. Devin Haney, has gone to 140. Right? At a time when legitimate cash cow kings... Ryan Garcia, when he's not suspended, was fighting at 140. Right? So Stevenson staying at 135, what he's going to find out is that they're guys with punches at 135. Zepeda, unbeaten. He's unafraid. 
right? If you can get Gervonta Davis to box you, you might be able to outbox him. Davis, and it's interesting, this is a vet move. Davis, the puncher, has a tendency to give away portions of the first four rounds. Even that Frank Martin fight, right? You know, Davis is a little bit sluggish early in that fight, right? Davis is not Nigel Benn. He's not going to come across the ring, try to make it a quick night so he can hit the club after the fight, right? He's not that guy. So there is a possibility that Shakur Stevenson cannot box Davis early. The problem is, after the sixth round, when Davis starts running inside, is there going to be enough resistance? I think the answer is no. Right? So those are the three bets that right now I'm interested in. Right? Each of them you're getting spectacular odds on. Right? I'm guessing a Shakur Stevenson Zapata fight, and I think Zapata wins that fight, uh, Stevenson's going to be the favorite. With regard to Tyson Fury, folks, the minute you hear Fury, that level of boxer, and they say a plus 145, I don't care who he's fighting. Right? I think very highly of many of the heavyweights out there. Right? I think Zhili Zhang is a major threat to the throne. I think gamblers got a break when Zhang lost to Joe Parker because people are now thinking that Zhang's more vulnerable than he is. Right? But my point to you is, Zhang Fury, if you're giving me a plus 145 on Tyson Fury, I have to follow the odds. I have to lock in that side of the play. Right? I'd hedge that with Zhang by stoppage. But understand, the Zhang by stoppage would be possible as long as it's less than a minus 145 if I've locked in a plus 145 on the Fury side of the play. Well, here, you're telling me that Usyk, who Joshua went the distance with twice, right? Let's be clear. Joshua goes the distance twice. Derek Chisora goes the distance with Usyk. Here, you're telling me that I'm getting a plus 145 on Fury. You really are that confident that Usyk is going to outbox Fury? Folks, without the knockdown, Usyk doesn't win the first fight. Look at the boxers, excuse me, look at the judging scorecards. So this plus 145, I'm guessing it's going to shrink before the fight. This is a summer line at a time when everyone's being inattentive and thinking about beach balls and volleyballs and cruises. Right? Fury plus 145, I'll be the casino's huckleberry on that. That's the betting side of the play. We'll hedge it. Right? This doesn't mean that I think Fury wins the fight. This just means that I think they're undervaluing him. The second bet um, on the presidential election, look, my best friends all believe Kamala Harris is going to win. So I know there's a bubble. I think Trump wins the election. The question to me is margin. Right? That's the only question in my eyes. Right? Um, I think Trump Winning the popular votes, one of the best bets on the board right now. But just be aware that history is against you. Democrats won the popular vote in 2000. They won the popular vote in 2016. They won the popular vote in 2012. They won the popular vote in 2008. Right? The line is what it is for a reason. Finally, Shakur Stevenson, look. You know, it'd be great if he was an Ali. If Shakur Stevenson had the ability to say, hey, I'm going to beat this guy in seven rounds and then, and then deliver, right? You know, if, if he was able to, you know, make it so that if you add together the rounds for the two Sonny Liston fights, and Liston to me is one of the best heavyweights in history. Right? Didn't have a long reign. That's not going to stop me from looking at film and saying, great jab, great power, two-handed. Right? Liston is so good, we all think he's bigger than he is. Right? Usyk is physically bigger than Sonny Liston. Right? You add together the two fights, Ali Liston 
You don't get 10 rounds. That's how dominant Ali is. The Cleveland Williams fight, to me, is the best fight I've seen a heavyweight throw down in history skill-wise. Right? Ali is just too fast. Right? And he's lackadaisical about it. In other words, he's confident in his hand speed. And he has a guy in front of him who was a fearsome puncher. Right? By the time Ali makes it to the 70s, folks, he's not close to the same fighter. Right? Well, all I'm saying is that's how Shakur is being priced. That's how people like Oscar De La Hoya are imagining Shakur Stevenson. Right, folks? Um, I saw the Shakur Stevenson De La Santos fight. Uh, let's just say Stevenson's at a stage in his career where he has to retool his setup. Right? Um, you know, so Cordina, okay, I'm expecting Stevenson by stoppage. Zepeda, <laughs> I'm expecting Stevenson to lose. Tank, I do think Stevenson beats Loma. Because like Stevenson, Loma doesn't have a big punch. Right? But the guys who do tell me that Stevenson's not going to make it through Zepeda and Tank Davis without a loss. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.